Good morning, Fountain City United Methodist Church. It's so good to be here with you this morning. And parents, this is your opportunity, parents and grandparents, to go ahead and set your child up with their own device where they can watch the video that Miss Jenny and I do every week along with the so-and-so show and the Ollie show. You've received your email this week with the printouts and if you can't print them out, just go ahead and pull the information and use your own Bible at home. I hope we're all doing that. We're moving through January and we're winding up our life app of responsibility. And our lesson today is one for all of us. As we go to the 25th chapter of Matthew, starting with verse 14. Matthew 25, start with verse 14 families in your at-home devotions and find out when that master gave the bags of gold what the servants did. Sometimes we're that very same way. We don't want to be that servant who buried the gifts from our God, do we? Okay, parents, it's time to, for us to all move to our devices. Thank you, love you, and as we always say, Please keep in touch. If you need anything, you have a prayer request, please text me or email me. Call me. We can talk anytime. Bye.
Good morning, Fountain City United Methodist Church. What a joy it is to greet you and to welcome you into this time of holy worship. We're so glad that you are able to uh, view this uh, service by a live stream. And uh, we look forward to a time when we will uh, not only be live streaming, but where we will be able to be back in person, indoors. So just uh, keep in touch through our, uh, through our website, through our Facebook page, and uh, we are continuing to track those numbers. And the good news is that those numbers are working a little more in our favor now. But we greet you in the name of Christ. Welcome to this time of worship. Just a couple of announcements uh, for our attention. I want you to remember that we have discipleship opportunities uh, uh, this week. Uh, actually, each week uh, we have discipleship opportunities for adults as well as youth and children. And in addition to discipleship opportunities, we have our Grief Share support groups and want to uh, particularly call your attention to that. Uh, that has been a hallmark here at Fountain City United Methodist Church for a number of years now. A small group, it is being done virtually uh, these days, but uh, can be of, of, of quite uh, uh, help and support as we encounter loss in our lives. We are within a week now of wrapping up our Invest in Hope Stewardship Emphasis. Thank you for the contributions, for the commitments that you have made already. And if you have not yet sent that commitment back in, would you kindly do that this week because we are counting on that as we project our ministries for this coming year. In light of that, that is a good segue into uh, ways that we can give really at any time through snail mail with a check, through our mobile uh, app, through our Realm app, texting a gift, and also online. We are glad to receive those gifts, and I trust that you are just as glad to be part of the ongoing of the kingdom of Christ here upon this earth. As we begin our day of worship, this being a fourth Sunday of the month, we are highlighting faith promise, and there are four mission endeavors that are before us today. Samaritan Hands, our Knoxville Habitat for Humanity, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and Holston Conference Hispanic Ministries. There's a website related to each of those four. You can find that, those uh, respective websites uh, on your bulletin, on the cover of your bulletin today. We're glad that we're able to uh, do ministry near and far through our mission efforts. And then I do call our attention to the beautiful flowers that adorn our communion table this morning. These flowers are given in memory of Dick Whitaker by Tom and Linda Whitaker and family. Thank you, Whitaker family, for providing these for our enjoyment and in memory of Dick. Will you join me now in our centering word and call to worship? God is our rock and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? For God alone our souls wait in silence. In God alone do our spirits find peace. For God alone is our rock and our salvation. In God alone does our faith remain unshaken. Pour out your hearts before God for God is our refuge and our strength. Put 
your trust in God. God's steadfast love endures forever. Amen. unite in this historic confession of the Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Forgiving God, we repent of all the ways we turn from you. You call, but we do not listen. You show us your path, 
But like Jonah, we prefer our own way. Forgive us, heal us, and lead us back to you that we might show mercy to others. Just as you forgave the people of Nineveh when they repented and turned from their ways, may you forgive us also as we turn toward you and walk the path of life. We pour out our hearts before you, O God, our refuge and our strength as we pray the prayer of Christ our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well done, choir of friends. You know, our, the biblical character that we're going to be focusing on today is Jonah. And uh, that anthem could have been written by Jonah. Jonah was called by God to do something that was not comfortable. And yet, God did not give up on Jonah after Jonah went the other direction from God's calling. And as a matter of fact, where we pick up this reading in the third chapter of the Old Testament book of Jonah, we find that God calls Jonah as God calls us multiple times. So God had not given up on Jonah, neither does God give up on us. The first five verses of Jonah chapter 3, and then a summary verse, verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And Jonah cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. And verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is a word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Most of us remember Jonah's story as the man who got swallowed up by a big fish. As a matter of fact, the big fish spewing Jonah out is the verse just before the text that we just shared. Those who love to fish are prone to telling about the big one that got away. Fishers are known for their stories that are really intriguing. From all that I can tell, there's a true fish story that has just appeared and apparently been corroborated by the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Association, the TWRA. It's about this, this man in a middle Tennessee lake, actually it's the Kentucky Lake, don't let that trip you up, but this fisherman caught 20,000 pounds of carp. There is an invasive kind of carp that came into 
the waters of East Tennessee in the 1980s, as I understand it, that TWRA is trying to get rid of. It's a pest. Some would say it's a beast. And here's what TWRA has posted. Quote, Anyone who catches a carp in East Tennessee is to save the fish by putting it on ice and contact the TWRA immediately or take a photo of the fish and email it and there's the email address. And I must confess, when I first read that, I chuckled because I was a bit confused because I don't know how to email one carp, much less 10 tons of carp. Let me just say, I do love seafood. I'm not a fan of sushi, but I would say you might want to think twice these days about eating fish because there seems to be plenty of carp out there. Now Jonah's story is more than a big fish story. The big fish part is a, it's just a part of the whole story. The big fish part is the part that we probably learned in Sunday school, perhaps in a Bible story book. But unless we really dig a little deeper into the story, it's more than the story of a man being swallowed by a big fish for three days and three nights and then being spewed up on dry land. Now God had asked Jonah, the prophet had entrusted Jonah with a message to go to Nineveh, a town of the hated empire of Assyria, because you see Assyria had conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And so when God tapped Jonah on the shoulder saying, I want you to go to Nineveh, we might be able to understand Jonah's reluctance. He didn't have a whole lot in common with the Ninevites. They were actually the enemy. Why would he want to go to Nineveh? In fact, instead of going toward Nineveh, Jonah found the first ship out of town. He bought a ticket according to the earlier chapters in this story. It's only four chapters long. You can read it very easily and put all of this into the context. But while Jonah is on this ship, A storm brews up and it raises the waters to where the waters are about to capsize the vessel. Raging waters. Jonah knows that the reason that the waters are raging, while all of the other seamen are out praying to their own gods, Jonah knows why this sea is stirring so much. He offers himself to be thrown overboard, and as soon as he's thrown overboard, then this big fish swallows Jonah, and he's in the belly of this fish. Some say a whale. The scriptures simply say a big fish and spews him out on dry land. 
And that's where our text picks up. Because the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. A second time. We dare not miss that. We dare not miss that this word was still alive. It was still active. It was still important. Lest we dismiss the power of words, we have certainly witnessed recently, and you can name almost any venue, how much words matter. Words can be just rhetoric, but words can then bring out all kinds of emotions, and quite honestly, they have and do. They bring out our worst demons and our better angels. That being true, how much more the word of the Lord matters. When God's calling comes upon our lives, it matters. God doesn't give up on Jonah, and God does not give up on us, no matter how many times we run from it, God's Word still claims us and calls us to that which is bigger than ourselves. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I've heard you calling in the night. We may run from that calling, but that calling will always pursue us as it pursued Jonah. That calling says, you matter. You are of infinitesimal worth. You have value. You are a somebody. And God loves you because you are created in the image of God. And there is nothing that you can do to pull that image out of you. Hear that. There is nothing that you can do to extract that image out of you. Therefore, God's love, God's calling will continue to pursue you because you are a magnificent creation in the eyes of God. This sermon that Jonah preached more probably likable than most of the sermons that I have preached because of its brevity. It's only eight words long. You can say a lot in eight words. Eight words can elicit a response. Did you catch this eight-word sermon as Jonah had gone only one day into Nineveh which is described as being a three days journey across. So he'd gone a third of the way in, and here was his sermon. Forty days more, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all it took. And to Jonah's dismay, and as a matter of fact, to his displeasure, if we stay with the story, again, read it for yourselves, the Ninevites responded, and they repented, and they turned toward God. They put on sackcloth. They covered themselves in ashes, which are both biblical signs of remorse and contrition. 
and an about face toward the one true God. Not long from now, we will be observing Ash Wednesday. And it's not just about burning the palm leaves from last Palm Sunday. When we enter Lent, we do so in the same spirit, repentance, contrition, and reminding ourselves that just like Jonah, perhaps we have run in the other direction from God and God's calling upon our lives. But there's more here, and we dare not miss it. You see, what is less obvious here is that as Nineveh is converted, Jonah the prophet is experiencing a conversion of his own. You see, Jonah thinks that he is already converted. After all, God has come to him. So the question here is an introspective kind of question. It's a look in the mirror question. It has something to say to those who think themselves already converted. It has something to say to me. It has something to say to you. There's a word or two here for the church and for those who have made a commitment to Christ through the church. The first word is that God still calls imperfect people. God still calls folks who may run away and go the opposite direction. That's the easy response to run away like Jonah did. Remember this, and you have heard it before, that it it almost sounds like a cliche, but it has very deep meaning. God doesn't call the equipped. God equips the called. It may take a second calling, it may take multiple callings, but God does not call the equipped already. Rather, God equips over and over and over the called. And yes, like God's calling upon Jonah, it may lead us to uncomfortable places. And I do have to ask myself, in this past year, now that we're two years into it, what does God calling look like now? It's probably a very different calling than any of us would ever have imagined. It's an uncomfortable calling. Staying true and staying faithful in light of all that's going on around us, and and even when we don't exactly have the same mind of how we do worship these days, what is God's calling today? I'll get just a little more specific and personal, if not offensive. Some are running away from church these days because it is uncomfortable or not to their liking. And as a pastor, as a shepherd of the flock, you probably don't know exactly how that feels. When God has called shepherds to tend to the flock and some of the sheep and some of the lambs go in the opposite direction, let me remind us that to wherever we run, God's calling will pursue us. 
And let me also remind you in the same breath, we will never run away from ourselves. So wherever you may wind up, wherever I may wind up, we will be there to face ourselves. It may be a different context, but we will still need to struggle with, it, with God's calling upon our lives. Whatever concern you have for church will come up again eventually in a different context until you face yourself and until you respond positively to the calling of, a, of God upon your life. Jonah is the witness to that. He could not get away from God's calling and he could not get away from himself until he faced both. The good news is that God never gives up on us. God gives us second chances, multiple chances, even for those who consider ourselves converted. We are still a work in progress. Remember when Jesus called the fishermen, Andrew and Peter, and James and John, they were just out there laboring from day to day, just trying to make ends meet, trying to get by, just trying to survive. When Jesus came along that fateful day and called them to a different kind of fishing expedition, they left everything and they followed him. There were times of doubt. There were times of denial. There were times of betrayal. But the calling pursued them. And they always had to face themselves because they were part of something bigger than, than themselves. And let me tell you that's one whale of a fish story that Jesus would call folks to be fishers and to go fishing for people. And whether you believe it or not, Jesus still does that. I believe it because I'm living proof that God's calling pursues and that I always have to look in the mirror and face myself. Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord. If you lead me, I will hold your people in my heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in the spirit of Jonah and the Ninevites, may we repent in sackcloth and ashes and turn again toward you, knowing that you don't call the equipped, but you equip the called. We thank you in the mighty and strong name of Jesus, who still calls us this day. Amen.
you for your presence with us this day. We trust that God's grace is indeed at work in all of our lives. And now may the God of second chances renew your sense of call and inspire you to go out and share the good news of forgiveness and hope. Amen.